right, welcome everyone. Your next session on, on Profit Club and Profit Club Academy. And in my, my search for global excellence, I've, I've, I've tracked down Mustafa Husseini from Calgary, Canada, who's going to join us for a presentation today. So Mustafa, thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. One of my favorite, favorite cities in the world, Calgary, and we, we chatted uh, a few times over the, the, my love of Calgary. So mate, uh, you're, you're, in, you're in a beautiful part of the world there. Now, my, my, my introduction, I'll, I'll do the formal introduction. I, I came across Mustafa on LinkedIn originally, and then I looked at some other information. And, and it really intrigued me, the, the area that he's got into. And we're going to talk today about the viral coefficient, which I, I love. I love what he's done there. So, and, it's, and it's just hot stuff for health professionals and health business owners. Formal introduction first. He's the founder of Persio Incorporated, which is the creator of viral coefficient formula. Uh, he's the creator of simple marketing formula and simple time management formula. So, mate, we could do we could do sessions on all of those things. So, they're, they're great areas. Uh, for the past nine years, he's helped business owners and entrepreneurs build profitable businesses in various niche markets and industries. Currently, he's focusing on helping health clinic owners primarily double their referrals and become more profitable in his spare time. Obviously, Calgarian, he's an avid skier and hiker. Yep. And love spending time with his with his family today. So, mate, thanks for being part of Profit Club. What's what's happening in Calgary? So it's raining right now, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's uh, it's been hot, and it gets like it's hot in the morning, and then it gets kind of cooler in the evening. It, you know, Calgary weather is very very um, uh, unpredictable. You know what intrigued me, but when I when I did work in Calgary and then and uh, Vancouver, so that side of, of the Canadian countryside. I did a lot of work with with groups of health business owners, and I was staggered how few of them had a, a get fit to ski program or some sort of skiing fitness program. And I, it staggered me that they didn't hadn't capitalised in that market in in places where there's mad skiers like you guys. It, oh yeah, amazing. yeah. Well, a lot of people hurt themselves with skiing too. So once you, if you start working out two or three months, like now would be a good time because in a, probably in eight, eight weeks, skiing starts here in Canada. <laughs> So, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it helps reduce uh, the chances of getting injured, I guess. So what's the real, real Mustafa story? Where did you spring from? Give us the, I gave you the glorified introduction. Give us the real guts of how did you get involved in this? Tell us a bit about your background. So I was, I was born and raised in Tehran, Iran, moved to Canada back in September 2000. And uh, back then, uh, I didn't speak any English, so I went to English school for a couple of years, and then uh, I, I got into engineering school on the advice of my dad. You know, Asians and Middle Easterns, they all have to be engineers and doctors, <laughs> and so I went to uh, in, uh, engineering school for two and a half years, and I realized that it wasn't my thing. I dropped out and got, uh, got into uh, business school, and I absolutely loved it. Got a diploma in marketing management, and then later I got a bachelor's a degree in business management with a minor in marketing. And uh, while I was in school, I started Persayo Marketing. Now, um, I grew up in a family where finances were always a problem. My dad was an employee. He was working from 5 a.m. to like, you know, 7 or 8 p.m. every day. And I had two sides to my family. One side where all doctors and engineers and people that were employed and the other side were all business people. And I was wondering, probably around the age of five or six, that why isn't my dad work so hard? And he doesn't make, seem to make as much money as my uncle. My uncle doesn't work as much. He's driving a better car. He's living in a bigger, better house. They take more vacations. And generally, they seem to have a better quality of smile on their faces. And so uh, I think I was about... But what I remember, I was about five or six years old that I decided to grow up and run my own business and become a businessman. So fast forward, being in Calgary, I think it was around the early days of Google where I got exposed to the self-help world. To guys like Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn and, and Les Brown and the rest of the gang. And I remember reading a, 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 or listening to Tony Robbins saying, if you read a book from... A person that, that, that put their 50 years of experience in a book, in a week, you could pr pretty much get 50 years of experience. Mm -hmm. So if you read a book per month, in one year, you could have 
uh, accumulate like about 600 years of experience. So that resonated really well with me. So I started reading and uh, I think it was around 2007 that I came across Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, yep. which was the exact story of my life. And it helped me confirm uh, my opinions and my thoughts around life and business. And you know how sometimes you have ideas, but you're not sure. But when someone else says, yeah, this is how it works. So, and it kind of kind of confirms your, your thoughts. And so I kind of, that helped me kind of push forward with my business ideas. So fast forward, 2010, I started Persona Marketing and uh, we did done for you marketing services uh, with a variety of businesses and, and, and clinics and uh, different law firms, accounting firms and whatnot. And we did all kinds of marketing services along with coaching and consultation. And back in 2017, I decided to drop the marketing services because that, that industry is super competitive. Mm. And uh, last year, I decided to niche down with health clinics. And well, why did you, you decide to go to health clinics, Mustafa? What was the attraction for health practices, uh, other, other than well, the fact we don't know what we're doing? <laughs> uh, so over the years, I've, we've, we have, we've had a really good experience with health clinics. And uh, I enjoyed working with, uh, with a few health clini clinics that I worked with. And uh, yeah, it's been good. So and I enjoy working with them. That's why. So what's a typical week for you now? You, you, you're, you're, on, you're on calls with businesses. You're doing marketing for them. What is it, what's the structure of it? So I just do my coaching and training and consultation, basically. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about well, our whole idea today that how to use viral coefficient to grow your health business. So where, sure. what, what, what is viral coefficient? I, lo I love that you've branded something, but I, what, the, what the hell is it and how can we use it? Sure. So viral coefficient is a ratio that describes how many referrals you're getting from your database, basically. Mm -hmm. So on top is the num on this ratio on top is the number of referrals and at the bottom is the number of people in your database. For example, if in the past 12 months you got 50 referrals out of 250 people in your database, that gives you a viral coefficient ratio of 0.2. Mm -hmm. Okay. That means that every five people in your database give you one referral. Yeah. So that's the simple explanation of viral coefficient. Where, where did this spring from? Did you just, because uh, look, I've, I've been in this game a long time and, and, I've, and I've, I've interviewed expert after expert about KPIs. And, right. and, and this is the first one I've ever heard of a, a referral coefficient. Like it's, a, I love it. Uh, I learned this 10 years ago in, a, in a, a business seminar from a guy here in Calgary named Jay Fassett. I learned it from him. Wow. And as soon as I learned the name, I heard about it, I went out and secured the domain for that name. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well done. I love it. So I've had the domain for 10 years. And then in the past year, I've put a program together. And I absolutely love client retention and referrals which we're gonna talk about more today. So in a, in a simple nutshell, we're looking at the, the number of referrals we get divided by our, our total number of people in a database, which is, it's not, it's not actually how many people are actually, what percentage of our clients are referring. What's, what's the, it's just how many referrals we're getting as a percentage of our database size. That is, that, that tells you what percent of customers are referring to you as well. So 20% okay. of your customers are referring to you. Okay. What, what, what numbers, I know it's, in terms of importance of tracking, it's important we know all our numbers. Right. What numbers are we looking for? What do we want? We want more, so in, in the viral coefficient program? Yeah. So we want to know our net promoter score. We want to know our client retention rate. And later on, I'm going to share with you a few more KPIs on that. Okay. As I dig deeper in the program. Okay. What, why did you do this? What, what led you to creating the viral coefficient program in the first place? So over the years, I have done various forms of marketing and from lead generation on Facebook and Google, from direct mail to, to phone calls and conversion optimization. And this is by far, bar none, the most profitable and the easiest way to generate business and to keep customer, customers, basically to get referrals. Okay. So 
um, I put together a, a, a list of uh, tools and techniques and action items that helps people grow and scale their business through client retention and through referrals. Basically, that's why I uh, created this program. So how does it how does it how does it help them? It, it it sounds like it just it helps them with structure and gives them a target. Is that kind of the major benefits? Yeah. So we have a checklist of 80, 18 action items that needs to get done to complete. Right. And then once you get there, our main KPI is to get a VQ ratio of one, which means uh, each customer is giving us a referral. And so, so I learned this from. Bill, Bill Glazer, who is Dan Kennedy's partner, or who used to be, I, I read in a book where he said, the fastest way for you to double the size of your business is to get each customer to give you a referral, mm. right? So if we could get each customer to give us a referral in a, in a short span of time, we could double the size of our business, given that we're also doing client retention to keep our existing customers so they're not dropping, Yeah, I'm right? Sure. So... The way it, the clinic owners benefit from this is it has a lower cost of marketing. It's about 10x lower. So lead, lead generation uh, costs each lead or each new customer costs anywhere from one to $300, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's a combination of money, time, and resources, right? But client retention and getting referrals, uh, the cost is anywhere from 10 to $50 per year per customer. So it's 10 times cheaper almost. Then uh, the clinic owners get sales consistency and recurring revenue. And so what happens is the first time, the first transaction or the first treatment that we do with a patient, because of the high lead generation costs, it is not very profitable, yeah. right? It's the recurring repeat business that becomes much more profitable. So, mm -hmm. and, and if we have say an average of 500 to $550 per patient, and we spent 300 bucks to get that patient, we only have 200 bucks in profits and we have to pay our overhead out of that as well, yep. right? Yep. But if we could get that customer back with 10 or $20, now we have $500 to ourselves. So 10 times more profits of almost. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's much easier to get business that way, about 20 times easier, better conversion rates. So, Lead generate new lead generation. The conversion rates on that is about one to three percent if you're lucky. Client retention conversion rates are ten to twenty percent. So out of every ten phone calls that we make, we get about twenty to thirty uh, percent repeat business, new appointments, or a referral from existing our existing database. Okay, so every so every Q then stuff. If we're talking about a, a number, so we're trying to get it to one. Uh, like right. if I've got a database of 100 and I get one referral, I'm a 0 0.01 viral coefficient. If I get, if I got a database of 100 and I get, and I get 10 referrals, I get a viral coefficient of 0.1. Exactly. It's, it's simply that mathematics. That it is. It's a and matter how, and, of number. And how, and how is it over a time period? So do you, when you do your VQ, if I assume that's what you call the viral coefficient, the shorten is VQ from what you said before. Right. Right. That's, is it over a 12 month period, over a three month period, over one year? What's you could the do, it, do, it? do it for any period that you want. You could do it 12 months, six months, last month, last quarter. So you could, you could track it month to month. Mm -hmm. So we do track it month to month and then we track it quarterly and annually to see where we're at. Okay. So I'm doing a, qu a, qu a monthly, a quarterly and an annually VQ because these guys, my members love their numbers. They love to know what they can measure and what they can measure they can manage. And that's, and that's where they want Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. No, it makes a huge difference to track numbers. Cause one, yeah, once we track the numbers, we know where we're going and what we can do with it. Now I know, I know our goal is one. So, but, but honestly, if I've got, if I've got a thousand people on the database, um, I might not have got a thousand referrals. So what, what is, what have you seen in terms of the viral coefficient scores that, that good practices are doing? So a viral coefficient of 0.5 is, is pretty easy to get. Okay. And so this, this takes time uh, to, to get to a VQ of one. But once we get there, because first we need to, uh, to kind of sell the owner on the idea. Yeah. Once he is in, we need to sell, sell the staff on the idea. So we need to train and educate them to ask for referrals. And then we need to, they need to educate our customers on referrals, which this all takes time. But it's like, it's a, 
some of the results come in fairly quickly when we start making phone calls and asking for retention and referrals. But some of them, some of it takes time, a, a little bit, a little bit of time to right. uh, start seeing results. What are some some of the, the top myths around this? What what myths have you have we seen about client retention and referrals? Because everyone's got an opinion uh, on it. What what are sure. the what are the common mis mistakes or, or myths? So the number one thing that I hear all the time is I don't want to bother my customers. When we talk about client retention, I don't want to call them too much. I don't want to email them too much. I don't want to be in their face too much which the exact opposite in, well, you don't want to call them every day, obviously, but if you don't stay in touch with customers, uh, it hurts you because on average you lose, if you don't stay in touch with your customers, you lose about 64 to 68% of your customers because they perceive that you don't care about them. Yeah. And quite frankly, if you do care about them, you would stay in touch with them. You would call them, you would, you know, gift them, you would take care of them. So that, that's myth number one. You, you do want to stay in touch with your customers. At, can I share a personal story? Love you too. Okay, so I bought $10,000 worth of furniture about five years ago from a local furniture store. The salesman kept promising to call me and let me know when the furniture was going to arrive. And it showed up a week late, and he kept promising that he was going to call. He never called. I remember they, they, they delivered the furniture and I put 10 grand on that. This guy never bothered to call me and say, hey, how's it going? Did you get the furniture? Did it arrive? Was there any problems? Is there anything I could do for you? Apparently 10 grand wasn't enough for him, right? And so what happened is I, I remember I was not happy. So what happened after was four or five months later, I went out and bought some more furniture and guess where I didn't go back to that guy because he didn't care. So, and then there, I, I'm a young guy with a young family. So I know a lot of people around me that are buying furniture. Guess who didn't get a referral? That guy. So by a simple phone call and it, 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 it's very simple. That's what I love about client retention and this whole program. All you have to do is like pick up the phone and literally talk to them for 60 to 90 seconds. Hey, how's it going? How's your knee? How's your back? Is it fixed? And, and so that, that experience kind of helped me be, be, become more sold on my own program, basically. Yeah. At, what, like, at what point, Mustafa, do you think we, we don't do this because we think, like as a health professional, well, I, I shouldn't have to, to do all this. They should be coming to me. I went to university. I'm the expert. Is there a perception that I shouldn't have to do this? which is the next myth. So the next myth is they will call me when they need me. I'm not going to call them, yeah. which with that attitude, you'd be hurting yourself, your staff, your family, and your customers. Cause what happens is I'm sure you're, you're, you're a physiotherapist. People tend to hold on to pains and try different modalities, self-medication and meditation, all kinds of things and hold on to pain for a long time, sometimes years before they, they go out and, 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 and fix it. Well, if, if you would call them up and, and six months later and say, and people hurt themselves all the time, right? Yep. If you say, hey, how, we fixed your back. Do you have any other problems? Yeah, you know, my knee kind of hurts and I'm scared. And if you kind of give them the pat on the shoulder and comfort that, hey, we could take care of you, you could bring them in. It, will, it would be more revenue. It would be customer satisfaction and you would be known as the good guy and, and all the good is that come along with that. Is it just, perception, is it just perception, Mustafa, that we think, we think that follow-up call is salesy and making us appear desperate rather than coming from a place of customer service? So if you look at it from, if you try to call them and sell them, yes, it is salesy, but if you approach it with the intention of helping your customers and staying in touch, then that's a different mentality and different approach, yeah. right? Yes, I have seen people when they call me as a follow-up, they try, they try to sell me. And, and don't get me wrong, we do want to sell. But we want to check up on you and see if they're in a place to buy, then we'll sell them. If they're not, we will follow up three months later or six months later and to, to yeah. when they're ready, basically. We just, we just did the sell without selling program, which I think I sent you some information on. So I got, I got Steve Jensen, a, a really a high quality sales guy to do a sales presentation or a one day sales training. 
and I remember in part of it, Mustafa, he said, when you get a lead on from from a, a website or some other thing, if you if you you got to ring them up within a minute to get them to book in. If you, if you don't, you've got to ring them two or three times throughout the rest of the day. And I saw the eyes of the health professionals in the room roll back when they thought, what, I've got to ring them more than once or I've got to make contact again. They, that was traumatic for right. them to think they've got to do multiple attempts to ring this person. It was, it was terribly confronting for them. Well, some people can't have that attitude, which is fine. I mean, you would go with what you're comfortable with, but there's some people would appreciate the fact that you followed up with them because they were busy. Mm. I get that a lot. And you'd be, you'd be surprised how many people would thank you for following up on a knee treatment or a back treatment saying, Hey, how is it going? Is your back okay now? And I'd be like, Oh my God, thank you for asking. Yes, it is. Or no, it's, there's still some pain. Yeah. So people would absolutely love it. I haven't seen a single negative comment or feedback on, on, on follow-ups. Is there is there a myth is there a myth Mustafa that I that I shouldn't have to? I'm I'm I went to university for five years I shouldn't have to do this. Is that a myth as well? Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. Oh yeah. And we've got to, and yeah. we've got to get we've got to get over that. The fact that it's customer service from a quality place, it's it's a it's a mindset more than anything else by the sound of it. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Taking care of your customers, nurturing your list, staying in touch. It's a matter of relationship, right? I mean, you would stay in touch with people that you love and you want to stay in touch with. with. And if you don't stay in touch with them, then, then there's not much love there. All right. So what does, right? what does the actual process look like? So if we talk about the process itself, so the, the viral coefficient formula, what are some specific action steps that, that make this happen or that, that you put into businesses? What do you got to do? For sure. So... I'm going to share, we got 18 steps in this program. I'm, I'm going to share up to seven or eight steps, time permitting. And uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask me any questions because once I start talking, uh, I, I keep going. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm very good at this, Mustafa. I, I want to drill down into each of these ones anyway. So, so, so when you get to each one, uh, before you say the next one, say, is there anything you want to ask me about that? <laughs> sure, sure. So, uh, the first one is quarterly plans and annual planning and so having KPIs around referrals. So uh, I am very big uh, on tracking measure and measuring numbers. I, I follow the Rockefeller habit system by Vern Harnish as my, as the foundation for my coaching practice. And so we do quarterly planning and annual planning and basically monthly planning. So what we do, the first step is to track and measure what is happening right now. How many referrals are we getting? How many patients do we have in our list? And then, so once we know our VQ numbers, then we know, okay, you know what? We're at a VQ of 0.1, and now we want to go to 0.2. So what do we need to do to get there? So then we set up goals, setting up goals. Basically, less than 3% of business owners have clear written goals. Those guys are 10 times more likely to actually achieve their goals. The guys that have a clear written goal. So you create a goal, and we set KPIs for referrals and customer service. And, and here are some examples. First KPI is number of referrals. How many referrals did we get in this program? Second one is number of appointments per year per customer. So on average, uh, I know some, some PTs and chiropractors are trying to aim for maybe five appointments for, per customer, right? That's per treatment. So they have a knee problem, they come in five times, three to five times, and they're discharged. Now this new KPI, is a matter of how many times do we bring this person back in 12 months, basically. So that we, if, if we have treated their knee, now we want to treat their neck. Now we want to treat their back, right? So that's the second KPI. Next one is number of repeat reviews per discharged per person. And so we want to make sure we get one review per treatment, basically. We're talking, we're talking Google review? What sort of review are we talking about? Here? Google or Facebook. Or a video testimonial. Okay. Okay. Can I go? Can I go back to one of your other KPIs? You talked about the the, the number of, of sessions delivered. So, health businesses will talk about a, a patient visit average or a PVA, which is that how many consults did you deliver over twelve months? What right. what what number are you looking for, Mustafa? When you do that, is there a, when you do these KPIs with the owners? Give us a ballpark of what you're what you're aiming for. So it really depends on the business. Let's say if you're at three. 
we try to boost it up to five. If you're at five, we try to boost it up to seven, right? Yeah, okay. We could go up to 12 visits per, per year. Let's say that you come in five visits for a knee pain, and let's say that you also offer massage therapy. Mm. Now, we could try to book them in once a month for massage therapy now. So now they come in a total of 12 times a year or maybe even more. Okay. Yep. Right. So we're getting, we're getting a patient visit average. We're getting, and how many reviews? What's our goal for reviews? Is it, what was the review goal? One per, re, per treatment. So if they come in to get their knee treated, we want to have a review on that treatment. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, per, 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 per episode, I suppose you're talking about. So per, per problem, per, sure, per, problem. Per, per course of care. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And the last one is the net promoter score. Yeah. And so every time we ask them, how likely are you to refer us? And that's, we try to, uh, we try to increase that as well. So that's. How often do you ask them to do the net promoter score or when, when do you do it? Is it the initial consult? Is it at the discharge? Is it both? At what, discharge, what's... pretty much right after discharge. Okay. Right, right. The day that the guy discharged, they got to get the email. Okay. And I'm going to talk about that uh, later as a side note as well. So that was the first one. So, so I'm, I'm going to wait for it. I'm going to quarterly. So first step, guys, is the quarterly or annual planning with KPIs around referrals. Look at your viral coefficient. Look at your PVA. Look at your Google review number. Um, and that's, uh, that's number of appointments per year. Got it. And the MPA net, net promoter score. score. Beautiful. Okay. So there's step one, guys. They so get that organized. What's the next one? Second one is hire a person full-time for client or customer or patient, patient retention. So what this person is going to do is he's going to make phone calls. He's in charge of following up, bringing customers back, securing referrals, staying in touch, uh, securing reviews and uh, testimonials. And this employee will perhaps be your most profitable employee, right? Wow. His full-time job is to keep people, bring them back and secure referrals. Now, what we want to do is, let's say that you have 5,000 people on your, on your list, right? And we have 261 working days in a year. We want to divide 5,000 by 261. Now, this person would want to make 20 phone calls per day to reactivate patients and to uh, follow up with existing patients or the new ones. You've got a, you've got a full-time, this is a, this is a full-time customer relationship manager, a full-time marketing yeah. manager. This is what we're doing here. Yeah. Some people call him the director of WOW. Some people call him client retention manager. There are different titles, but those are my, my top favorite ones. Client retention manager and director of WOW. Wow, and so, okay. and so this person would have a script and we have the script in our program included. So he would call and it would go something like, Hey, it's me from ABC clinic. I'm calling, calling, see how, how things are going with your knee treatment. Is it a hundred percent? Are you still having pain and whatnot? We get the response on that. And then would you, do you need to come back? Do you, and, or do you have any other type of pain or whatnot? And based on what's going on on that checklist, on every phone call, this person would ask for a referral. Who do you know around you that has neck, back, or knee pain or shoulder pain? Every single time we get in touch with a customer, we ask them for a referral. And eventually, when we ask them enough times, um, they, will, they will kind of get educated. One myth that I didn't get to discuss was some people say, if I do a good job, they will refer me. And the, the fact is they do not automatically refer you. I've had many, many customers where we've done an outstanding job for them, but they did not refer us until we started asking them for a referral. So we got to educate. Them. You, you might've heard the one, um, I had heard this from Dan Kennedy once, the, was it the barrier, the barrier to refer is, is higher than the barrier to continuing to patronize, which, which kind of was meaning from, from Dan Kennedy just because someone's coming back to see you as a client, that's a lower barrier than them referring someone. So you've got to go above and beyond that to get a referral. We, we think because they're still coming back themselves, they'll refer, but the, yeah. the referral barrier is higher because that puts them at risk in case you do a bad job. Exactly. All right. Exactly. All right. Um, I, I, I love this. The, the, K, the KPIs then for this, 
customer retention person. I assume that we're going back to point one and asking that they're doing the same thing. So what's, has having this new person increased your viral coefficient? Has it increased your PVA? So his cap, one of his KPIs would be the number of reactivated patients, number of referrals that he has secured through his phone calls and follow-ups, yeah. uh, number of phone calls that he has made on any given week or a given month. And uh, because yeah, those would be some of, some of his KPIs. Is there, is there a, a clinic size that would justify that marketing cost, Mustafa? When you, when you look at practices, do you have to have, I don't know, let's say three full-time equivalent therapists to make it viable financially to have a customer retention person full-time or could a smaller practice about, have a part-time? I think it's more about a, the number of people you have on your list. Basically, if, if, um, if you make, so let's say if you make 20 phone calls a day, on average, that will give you three to five appointments or three to five type of a mixture of business or referrals. And if per customer is worth $500 for you, that's about a thousand bucks a day. Okay. Where, where, do, where do you find this person? Where do we, what do we look for in this, in this customer? Species? So I have actually, I was thinking about putting a job description of this person in the program too. So our, 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 that coaching clients don't have, so they don't have to go through create it. Yeah. So I will include that in there as well. So we would put a job posting and uh, the job posting would be, the way we put it out there is in terms of, how do I put this together? In terms of the results that they're going to get, mm -hmm. being able to reactivate five customers per day, being able to book three appointments a day type of job ad. So they see, they're like, oh, you know what? I could do that. So we put it out there, we interview it, that, that person and then and then get them going if you know your numbers well enough Mustafa, if you know your numbers well and if you know what a new client or returning client is worth for you it's not it's not hard to work out well i i'm going to put this person on it might it might not be 40 hours a week it might be 20 hours a week and you and you can track their numbers and then you can if they do well you increase them i think Absolutely. i think from, from what you from what you're saying and what i my experience with health businesses they, they might get their therapists to make some of these follow-up things between patients. They might get a front desk person to do some, but, right. it's not, but it's not their prime job. No, it's not. And most of them don't like to do that. Yeah. And, most right. of them and most of them aren't very good at it and have been, haven't been trained at it. And as a result, their results aren't great. Right. 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 But right. so you, you're exactly right. You, you, you can hire this person, um, part-time first, have him pretty much pay, pay for his wage and work his way up, mm. right? Yeah. And so he would be working with your referral partners, maybe other, other doctors, other people that refer to you and taking care of them and then more than that. Um, uh, it's coming. I remember, I remember hearing about a chiropractor. I, I mentioned about this in some of my talks. The chiropractor that had a full-time concierge, he, he, it was basically... Um, the role of the concert, she was, she was just the meter and greeter. She was to make people feel special. And I'm sure their role had a lot of these other things in it, follow up. And if you've got a good rapport, I'll be ringing you up, Mrs. Johnson, to make sure you're okay. That, that's, that's almost this position with an extension of it. It's, it's the relationship manager. Absolutely. That, that would be the director of wow. So to, to deliver wow experiences to customers. All right. right. So hire, right. hire a person. Number two was hire a person for, customer retention make that a make that a job description does does yeah. well, before we move on do some practices think that's just their practice manager well they just say well that my practice manager does that yeah well uh, well some people think their office manager should do all of this marketing <laughs> managing and the whole but no this would be a full-time job all right great depending on the size of business yep so the next item on the list is identifying your personal and company values and displaying them on your marketing material. Now, what happens is your values determine who you attract. For example, my top values are number one is family, number two is business, number three is growth and learning. Now, Paul, do we share any of these, me and you? Yeah, very, very much so. I think we're the same. Yeah, so we attracted each other. Yeah. Now, one, once people see that value and you display that, attracting them becomes easier. And then keeping them becomes easier. And that's how it plays in the 
applying the retention role because they'll go around and be like, this guy share, shares the same values as I do, right? Mm -hmm. And so I should go back and they will refer other people who have the same values to you saying, hey, this guy is a great family guy. He's a great businessman. You should go sit down with him or you should get your, uh, you know, get your knee treated with him yeah. or with her, basically. Yeah. So the way, way you, so what you want to do is you want to display your values on your marketing materials and on your website. And here's an example. If you look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll see that I'm holding my kid in that picture. So that tells you right away that family is, is, is a value to me, right? Or you'll see that you'll see a picture of me skiing because I love skiing. So we're going to connect right away. That's me without me saying I'm a father and I love my family. It's like sub subconsciously, but it's very powerful, right? Yep. Now, to get your values determined, uh, uh, you could go to Dr. Martini's website. He has a value determination uh, process or software where you go answer a bunch of questions, and at the end, he will give you the top, your top values, right? Okay. That's how I got it. And then, uh, yeah, marketing becomes a lot easier and referrals, referrals become a lot easier as well. So where do we, where do we actually display these, Mustafa? So you say we, they're on our website. Do we have them on, on, the, on the wall? Do they have them at the front desk? Where, how, in our emails, how do we get the message out that these are what we value? You could have it on your walls. Here are our values. You could have uh, on your about page under each, say, PT's uh, bio, you could say, Paul's top values are this and that, and then you could show it. And then, so you would have your company values, then you would have your personal values, and then you would just uh, display them on your about page, on your, and you could be a, get a mix of pictures and, uh, and show, show what you value basically. It's interesting you have the photo of your child. I, I do a lot of work with a, with a guy named Terry Dean, who's an online marketing expert. And Terry, Terry's done lots of, of measurement of different things. And, and his, his mantra is to help people earn more, work less, and enjoy life. That's his, his plan. And, and, the, and when he does his marketing, he's got a photo with him in a suit. And there's a photo of him with his dog. And the dog, the dog photo always outs, outperforms the suit photo every time. Absolutely. It's not what he's about. You've got to get all the dog people, right? Yeah. And just people that see, well, if the dog likes him, uh, and that's his, he's, he's about, he's about quality of life. He's about family. He's about fun. Whereas the corporate, the corporate suit is certainly an image, but it doesn't fit the value of the family loving guy. The, the corporate guy with the suits, a different value proposition. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that the guy with the dog is a lot easier to, to, to do business with yeah. and to pick him over a guy in a suit. Yeah. Right. And we look for, and we look for commonality. Now we, and, and, yeah, we're looking for what are, what do we have in common? And if it's, is it the dog? Is it the family? Is it skiing? All these things make people have a better affinity with you um, across the board. Interest, interesting. Okay. For, I'm, I'm put this out there as, a, as an interesting one. Do you want your brain surgeon in, in this, in the coat with a stethoscope or do you want him with his dog? I would want him with his dog. Yeah. <laughs> The brain surgeon. It was, I just thought of it then. I thought, what would you, what would you want is, if someone's going to operate on your brain to save your life, who, who do you want? The family loving guy or do you want, you want the guy with the, with the suit and the stethoscope? <laughs> um, I don't know. For me personally, I would like to see the guy with the, good, with the dark coat. That's more of a person. That's more of a human, uh, right? It's all about uh, perception, is it? The, the, the commonality. So, so number three, Mustafa, identify personal and company values display them, make them, make them visible on your website, make them in the office, put them right. all over the place. Right. Brilliant. Number four. Now, another one, a way to, to display values is collect reviews and stories on your values. So the way you would do that is let's say one of our values, let me just open this up and share it with you is nothing less than super happy customers. That's one of our values. Yeah. So the way we do that on our say Rockefeller, uh, habits like the our, our one page strategic plan is the actions that we take to to live up to our values to this specific values stay in touch with cus customers on a daily and weekly basis to make sure that they are super happy so we deliver that value through follow-ups through, through asking questions through 
at designing our, our service process, our customer journey map, and the rest of it. And then so once the customer, uh, and the best time to get reviews is right when they get the treatment. Mm. So what, what some people do is they wait a day or two or a week or two or a month or two to get the review, and by then they have forgotten about it. You, you want to make and secure the review on the day that they get the treatment. If it's the first treatment and they, they improve 60%, right? Say half of their pain is, pain is gone. Right there and then while the emotion and the feeling is there, you want to ask for the re review or the, or the testimonial. Because mm. they're 90% more likely to write a review for you then compared to two weeks later. Because by, by, by then they have forgotten about it, basically. Do you find right? health professionals, Mustafa, are also reluctant to ask for reviews because yeah. they think, well, I've done a great job. They'll surely they'll review me anyway because I'm because I'm good. Is that again one of these myths we've talked about that people are doing? Everybody is. Everybody is. People are kind of scared to ask for a review, but once you get once you, so once they are hot into after the treatment with the feeling and the emotion that oh my god, this, I had neck pain and headache for twelve years, and you just fixed my headache with one treatment. That is the best time to ask versus two weeks later. And once you get into uh, the habit of asking, it just becomes a, a, a routine after, I mean, after a while. Okay. It's not that bad. So it's, so it's, a, it's a, a structured format where we're collecting stories, collecting reviews, and not being scared about asking for them. Absolutely. I mean, you, you help fix somebody's problems. It was a massive pain or whatever it was. You might as well just get some reviews. Now, these reviews are going to help you uh, help people to pick you over your competition. Imagine you pick in a hotel. Now, hotel number one has no reviews. Number two has five. And number three has 27 reviews with, with an average of 4.8. Yeah. Which one's more likely to get your business? Probably the one with 27, 27. Now, another thing about reviews is you do not want to have 100 reviews of five out of five. That looks fake. People think you paid your cousin to kind of write, write it up, basically, right? So once in a while, it's perfectly fine and natural to get a bad review just to make it more natural and because we always get those customers that are never happy. So as long as you, as long as you reply to it and say, we're sorry, we didn't live up to your expectations and please contact me. We'd love to, we'd love to make this right. As long as you, you can turn to a positive. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to respond to all of them and make sure that, you know, it is responded properly. So, Next one is identify your top patients. These are your, the top 20% of your patients that give you 80% of your sales. I call them your top 20% club members. Mm -hmm. Now, the 80-20% applies to everything in life and business. It's a universal law. So we might as well just take advantage of it and use it to our, um, to our advantage for our business. Now, if you double down your your money, energy, and resources on your top 20% of your customers and try to find people similar to your top 20%, the 80% that sales that comes from these people could easily double and you could go up to 160%, mm. right? Yep. And so it's a matter of, because now each customer that you add to the list will increase your sales significantly, right? It's just analyzing your current list and, and identifying the uh, root, uh, the uh, similarities on your top 20%, who they are, what are they like, how old are they, are they, what kind of problems did they have and whatnot, and focus on those. What do we do with them once, once we've identified them? What do, we, what do we do with them to make them feel special? I will get into that in a second. <laughs> right, I know. I know. This is, this is good stuff. So these are your important customers. These are the customers that we don't want to kind of, uh, dif we don't want to discriminate, but these guys bring in 80% of our sales. We need to take extra care of them. So these are your VIP customers. So what you want to do is you want to have, if they bring in 80% of your sales, they kind of deserve up to 80% of your time and resources, but they, they're not that demanding. But I, what I would do is put, 50 to 60% of time and resources on these people and finding people similar to this, to this group, right? Yeah. Now, 
let me explain the next group of people and I'm going to share with you what we're going to do with them. Would that be all right? Yeah, do that. So the next is identifying the top referrers. These are the people that refer to us all the time. Now in that list, 20% of the referrers give us 80% of our referrals. Now those become our 20% club members as well. Right? So we want, these are our rock stars. These are our promoters. These are the people that walk around and walk the people off the street into our clinic, into our office, right? So what we want to do is um, take care of them, gift them, nurture them, and I'll get into that in a, in a second. But what these guys do is they send us business for free. So the, the two to three hundred dollars that cost of lead generation with these guys is free. And saying what we want to do is with these people, we don't want to be greedy. We don't want to be, uh, we want to take care of them. And if we don't, eventually they will stop. Yeah. Right? And so we want to do that to um, encourage more of what, of what, what they're doing, to reward them for their action, for the business that they send us. And it doesn't have to be a massive reward. I remember I, sent, I sent a referral to a chiropractor friend of mine. He gave me a $10 Starbucks card and I was super happy. But for the following 15 referrals that I gave him, I got nothing. I remember I was not happy. Ooh. And all he had to do was to give me a cookie or call me and say, thank you. That's it. Right? Yeah. So it's just a matter of taking care of them. And recognition is the big thing in this game. So the next, the next thing we're going to do with this top 20% club members is this. We're going to run a VIP event once a year, bring the top 20% um, patients and the top 20% referrers and referral partners and throw a VIP kind of event. Wine and cheese, food, uh, a kind of fun event to get together. Now, we're going to introduce these guys together. They're going to network. They're probably going to do business. Um, so we take care of them. We will most likely secure appointments in that event from the same group of people or secure more referrals from them. Yep. And then you establish yourself as the authority for gathering people together. Have it at the practice, Mustafa? Do you have it at, at the business? Uh, at the business or at a local hotel or a community center where if you have enough space, you, you could. Mm. It's 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 your preference. Guest guest speaker, something something to attract them. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Games you could have fun games, guest speaker, uh, wine and cheese, whatever that would fit fit the, the need of your your niche. I guess yeah. my um my clients would would members of the club would would remember the session we did with Dustin Berlinson. Uh, you might know Dustin from GKIC from Glazer Kennedy. Uh, he, he's, oh, yeah. he's an orthodontist in, in Kansas, big, big business orthodontics in Kansas. Uh, he hires out the local amusement park once a year for a private client event and wow. catered the whole thing. And all his VIPs go to the, to the amusement park for the, for the Burleson orthodontic event every year. It's just, it's great. And, and that's awesome. And they're, oh, yeah. and, they're, and they're climbing over themselves to get their, their friends to be invited. So they're all talking about Berlin's and orthodontics. It's brilliant. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you show this guy's a good time and they're more likely to refer to you, to give you their business, pre pretty much refer their network to you. As I, said, as I say to my guys, it's easy for Dustin because every client's worth probably 10 grand to him. But uh but, yeah. but in, in healthcare business, it might be a thousand bucks. It might be 500. It's still, still the principle still the same. You don't have to book out the local amusement park. <laughs> but but, but we got to also remember, these are a top 20%. They're worth more than our regular average guys. Yeah. Right. They're probably spend two or three times more than our average guy. Yep. With us. So the next one is educate your team for better customer service. Um, this plays a major role in, in, in client retention which is if people are happy, we, they get good customer service, they're more likely to come back and refer people to us. So what we want to do is we want to draw our customer journey map of what happens step by step at, at each step, step of the game. And what we need to do is identify the bottlenecks. Where do we need to uh, improve? What do we need to work on? What do we need to get ourselves better at? Uh, and 
the place that I would start is on your website. Is your website designed for cu good customer service? Is it delivering good value to people, right? And one thing you could do is to do some user testing, get some of your customers or potential customers, have them interact on your website while you watch them quietly, not commenting, and have them speak their mind out loud. So they'll say something like, I was looking for a book now button here, but it's not there. I was looking for this information, but it's not there. If you do five or six of that, of these user testings on your website, you're gonna get uh, and apply what you learn. You're gonna improve your conversion rates and the, the usability of your site probably up to 30%. Mm. Every good time. tip. We we don't do it, do we? We we get the web guy to do it, and we sit there and say, "Oh, that looks good." But we never, you never call your call your mum in to mum go on that website and see if you can make an appointment or something, will you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or ask your customers, or ask someone else to go on the site. Say say, "What do you think?" Is does does does? So when we design it, we think it's the best, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then, and and then, yeah. People go in there and they don't book appointments and we're wondering why it's not working. Well, where, where the big, the big bottlenecks, Mustafa, so you say the website's a big bottleneck for customer service. What about, what about front desk and phone? Are they, are they big, big areas yeah. as well? That's the next biggest one. Front yeah. desk. Absolutely. Right. That's why uh, guys like Rick Liu with uh, yeah. call hero. Yeah. His service makes a huge difference there. Yeah. So it's a great Tracking. program, isn't it? So educate and be, I suppose most health, health professionals don't, maybe they don't even think they're in customer service. They think they're a health professional. And I suppose they've been, they've been brought up waiting in the waiting room with the doctor for an hour for a doctor that's running late and they just expect that from healthcare. But it's not going to yeah. cut it these days. Is it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, what you want to do is you want to map out exactly what happens step by step before, during and after the treatment for customer service so you know it. And then what, th what this does is you could use this for training, for creating consistency with your staff, uh, uh, with your PTs, with your chiropractors, massage therapists, so everybody is on the same page, yeah. right? So that will do um, a lot of good for your customer service. And once you, once you map it out on a piece of paper or on a, or on a whiteboard, and you see it, you could uh, eliminate the extra steps as well mm. of what you're doing it's so effectively you're, you're going to map out your client journey what's exactly. what's the client what's the client journey where and where are the opportunities in that journey to in, in, improve our customer service and where where are we falling down it's a we don't we don't do this stuff we just create the program absolutely absolutely all right, but I'm looking at the clock. I've got, a, I've got, a, you got a couple more for me, and we're gonna to have to wrap it up. I got, I got a thousand. Give us, give me a couple of others. All right. So next thing is you want to educate your team to ask customers for referrals. This is prob one of the biggest ones in getting referrals. So uh, your PTs, uh, they should have a section or a line uh, on their checklist. Hopefully, if they have a checklist, to ask for a referral, right? So they go through, they check the knee, they check the back and do the assessment and whatnot. And when they're done, um, how do I put this together? Right when there is a massive improvement, you should ask for a referral. And right before discharge, you should ask for a referral. And it could be as simple as, hey, as you know, you know, most of our businesses come, come coming from word of mouth. Do you know anybody around you that is having similar issues or different pains in their body that we can help them? you know, live a pain-free life or we can help them get moving. And it, it's as simple as that. And that's not that, that confrontational, right? Do we, um, with, with, that, with that script, Mustafa, do we then say, well, would you be happy for me to give them a call or do you, do you, do you let the patient then let the person know about how, how aggressively, I just know, from, I've done a lot of work in the fitness industry and they will, they will ask you to write down the names and phone numbers of five people who right. may be interested. That's a pretty aggressive right. approach. How, how aggressively do we do that after we've done the script? What I would do is if, if they're in for a five treatment type of program, if on a second treatment, they have a good improvement in what we're dealing with, let's say the half of the problem is fixed. I would bring it up and say, Hey, do you know someone else that in your, in your network that is having problems? 
And if there was, if this, if he or she says yes, we say, hey, would you be able open to talk to them so we can kind of bring them in and take care of them? And if they say yeah or nay, you can say, are you open if, to me giving them a call on your behalf, or would you like to talk to them? Now, if you if you kind of bring that up halfway through the treatments, you have two or three sessions or two or three following follow up sessions to kind of ask about that referral. Mm. But if you ask upon discharge, the guy is like, okay, I'll think about it. And then they're gone. Mm. But then we're going to have our client retention person call and ask for referrals. Mm. Yeah. But, but while they're hot on their treatment, that's the best time to ask for a referral. And secure. Yeah. It's a nice, it's a nice flow. And isn't it? If they come back again, Hey, did you get a chance to speak to your mother about that knee problem she's having? Cause I, I really think we can help her. Do you want me to give her a call? Like it's a nice, it's a nice thing you can bring up each time. Um, yeah. Without being pushy. It's just, and, and again, as, as we've done with all of our programs, none of this is heavy selling. It's, it's, there's a person out there with a knee problem who you think you can help. It's, you have a moral obligation to try and give them that help. That's yeah. I don't know what to do. Absolutely. If, if my mother's knee hurts and you can help them, I would be happy if you actually, as a matter of fact, aggressively follow up with me Yeah. because Hey, it's your mom. You should take care of her. Yeah. How's your mum's knee? She's still limping around. Gee, what sort of son are you, Mustafa, that she's limping around? Just get involved, will you? Just, <laughs> I can see where this would go. Yeah. What's the matter with you? <laughs> and then, so um, that we talked about a client retention person as well. So if, if the appointment is not secured. Now, one thing we need to remember is you are going to need to ask this person a few times for referrals to educate that person to refer to you yeah. once is not enough twice is not enough right mm -hmm. and um and the next point that i and hopefully i i think we're running out of time that's our final point uh and that is we want to show evidence of referrals everywhere and show them that this is what i learned from dan kennedy show them that everyone refers to us and so should you and if you're not something is wrong with you <laughs> oh, I love that. I love the very subtle approach from Dan Kennedy. It's very, it's very subtle, isn't it? <laughs> so, well, we don't quite, quite put it that way, but it's kind of like, hey, everybody's referring to us, and so should you. So, we want to put evidence of us getting referrals on our website, on our monthly newsletter, in the waiting area, in the treatment area, on our marketing material, on the back of our business cards. Basically, everywhere they go, they see evidence of us getting referrals. And so what, we, what it would look like is say, in the wait, waiting area, we would say, thanks, Stephanie Miller, for five referrals last month. So people could see that there is a person that gives us five referrals. And then in the next room, we're going to say, thanks, Joe Smith, for 12 referrals this month. Or, you know, however you're going to put it together. Or uh, I know... Uh, uh, one of our PT uh, friends, uh, he, he thanks his um, winner, referral winner, for winning the gift of the month, yeah. which is pretty common. Yeah, the, refer so, the Al Refer of the Month program. Thanks. Yeah, I yeah, love it. Yep. And then once they see it, it's, it you're, you're subconsciously training them to refer to you. Yeah. It's, right. it's, it's simple stuff, isn't it, Mustafa, really? It's systematic, yeah. it's structured, but we just, we think we, are, we open the doors, the people will come, and we do a great job and they'll come, but gee, we're missing some opportunities. Absolutely. So most of what I, what I talk about, you, you guys have heard about it. It's nothing new, and it's easy to do, but it's also very easy to not do, not to do, mm. basically. Yeah. But when we do it, boy, is it profitable, boy, is it sweet yeah. when we yeah it, it's great isn't it because you look at you look at marketing and you look at, at all the ways you can generate business and we look at the money like i've got i've got clients spending thousands of dollars a month on google ads and thousands of dollars on newspaper and and other things other other than the cost of your person that we're putting that full-time customer service on and the and the odd cheese night and <laughs> and the occasional gift it's it's a pretty cheap sort of investment isn't it absolutely absolutely so what what i mean 
if he could secure 10, 10 new patients or recurring patients or reactivate 10 patients per month, let's say you pay, and you're not going to pay him five, five grand a month. If you pay him three grand a month from plus some bonuses, he will, he or she will pay for himself in no time. Yeah. That's yeah. why I say this guy's, this guy or girl will probably be your most profitable employee. And you could even look, just thinking about it then, we've, we've often got a standout front desk person, someone who's really good with people and has a good, and yeah. it's pretty easy to promote that person and take them off the front desk and give them 10, 20 hours a week to be in charge of customer service because they've already been identified as the superstar. For sure. Easy to do, For mate. Sure. But I, I, love, I love what you laid out here, Mustafa. I love the simplicity Thank of it. I love, I love the idea behind certainly the viral coefficient. I, I, I love that. But how, how can people find out more about you and the VQ program? Where do they go? So uh, I'm sharing the entire blueprint of the program on our site. If uh, people uh, go to persai.com slash VQ, they can download the entire blueprint. I shared 10, 10 points here. There are 18 points so far. We'll probably uh, add a few more points to, that, to the list over time. But you could download it. You can start implementing um, the program yourself. But if you'd like to get uh, my assistance and uh, if you'd like my help, I'm offering a free 30-minute um, discovery call, if you will, uh, on how we could apply this for your business. We could probably go over your top challenges and see what we could do to improve your um, VQ ratio. And, uh, and what, what's, what's the website again, Mustafa? What was the, what was the URL? Persayo.com, P-E-R-S-Y-O.com slash VQ. That's vector and Q as in Cora. And uh, yeah. Thank you, I, mate. I, I, I love it. Yeah. Are Why we going to be able to include the link in, our, in the show notes or somewhere? Yeah, we, because it's an audio program, Mustafa, just if they go to the URL, if you've got the URL, the link, if they can go to your homepage or contact you, can they contact you via LinkedIn? Is there a way to get in contact with you Absolutely. personally? If you search for Mustafa Hosseini, I am, I'm right there. I'm holding my kit. That's, that's how I differentiate myself. And it's H-O-S-S-E-I-N-I. -S -S -E so Mustafa Hosseini.com. Find him on LinkedIn um, or the website again, URL was? Persayo.com, P-E-R-S-Y-O.com. I love it. I, lo I, loved your, I loved your profile when I saw it. I loved everything you did. I went to your website, had a good look around. Mate, I, I love what you're delivering at the moment. So um, you're doing some great stuff, mate. So on behalf of Profit Club, a great, great session. I love what you did. I'm going to start working now on this VQ thing for all of my clients. So I love, I love the concept and love the ratio. Well done. Fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate that. Now, on, on behalf of Profit Club, thanks for being part of the program. Now, um, if you aren't currently a Profit Club member, you've got, to listen, you've got this, this session in some other means. If you want to become a member of Profit Club and get access to great programs like this one with Mustafa, go to healthbusinessprofits.com forward slash Profit Club. That's healthbusinessprofits.com forward slash Profit Club. And members, make sure you look, go into the academy and make sure you check out all the other past sessions and share that with your team because it's great to get information to them from people other than just the owner of the business. Look forward to seeing you next month. <laughs>